sermon notes, and, and I did that on purpose. May, some of you got them, some may not have. You can get them on the way out. On the inside of this is my schedule. I'm headed to India tomorrow, tomorrow morning, headed to India, and uh, I really would appreciate your prayers, all right? And so on this, I have a list of prayer requests, and I have my schedule as to what I'll be doing when. One of the easiest ways to do this as far as praying is when you go to bed, think of us over there in India because that's, it's a ten and a half hour time difference and uh, that's normally when we're starting to minister. In fact, I land in Delhi at uh, 3 p.m. their time um, and then I speak uh, at, a, um, at a New Year's Eve service at 10.30 at night. Uh, so I'll get a few hours of rest and then I'll be preaching. I'm very much looking forward to that. And, uh, and then we've got some other things that are listed there as to what we're doing. We're just doing two pastors' conferences this time. Uh, the one that we were hoping to do did not come through, but I've got a lot of work to do on my uh, ministry, 800followme.com, and uh, so we're hoping that we'll have the opportunity to be able to do that as well. So uh, that's there for you if you like to keep notes, uh, keep score. We've got this on this side, and then some information about the ministries that we're involved with on the flip side. And then on the way out, if you would like, uh, we have some calendars with our picture and uh, suitable for placing down in the basement uh, against mice. Um, if, you would like, uh, if you would like a calendar, Vani will have some, I'll have some, and uh, we'd be happy to, uh, happy to give those to you. I want to thank Pastor Howard for allowing me to speak today. And uh, I made a comment a couple weeks ago when uh, Bill Early, missionary Bill Early was here, and uh, Bill was just as shocked to see me as I was to see him. He didn't know that I attended here, and I didn't know he was going to speak. And, uh, and I made an off-the-cuff remark saying, they never let me preach here. That's not true, and I apologize for that. I apologize to the pastor for it. I shouldn't have said it. Uh, you've given me plenty of opportunities to preach, and I always enjoy doing so. One of the things I'm going to miss um, when I'm over there is New Year's Day and pork and sauerkraut and mashed potatoes, all right? I, I already know that that is not a staple in India. Um, I'll, I'll be talking to the mullahs uh, afterwards to see if there's any festive foods that they have on New Year's Day. But uh, the mashed potatoes, I'm sure I could mash them myself. Uh, the pork I would not trust. All right, I'm a very picky eater when I go to India. I always lose about 15 to 20 pounds because of it. So I'm starting my diet uh, starting January 1st. And um, the sauerkraut, do they make sauerkraut over there? I mean, I, you know, I don't know. Maybe they do. It's just cabbage um, that's sour. Uh, the, um, there's a reason for us eating pork and sauerkraut. And you know that. It's for good luck, right? And uh, it has never worked for me. Um, but. Although I just love to do it. And, uh, but that's, that's what it was. Various different cultures have different customs uh, related to New Year's and to good luck. And, uh, and this is one of them. Eating for luck, it's called. And uh, the reason why the Germans and those people got this idea about pork is they would go out hunting for wild boar. And uh, they would kill wild boar on New Year's Day, and then they would cook it. And there's two reasons why this became significant to them for good luck. Number one, uh, wild boars dig into the ground going forward, okay? So the snout is in the ground going forward. They want to be going forward, all right? That's about, you know, chickens and others. They run backwards, I guess. I don't know, but these go forward. <laughs> and so that's one reason. The second reason is it's, um, they're big and plump. You know, and so the, the thought is you're eating something that, you know, will sustain you for a while. The sauerkraut, on the other hand, is a staple in German Pennsylvania Dutch uh, diet. And uh, they have that in the fall where they, they add that to fresh pork. And then at uh, Thanksgiving and or Christmas, it's turkey and sauerkraut. And then during the winter, it's salted pork. And then with sauerkraut and during the spring, it's fish with sauerkraut. The only time they don't eat it is during the summer, I guess. I don't know. But, uh, and the mashed potatoes. Who doesn't like mashed potatoes? All right. So I'm not going to get the pork and sauerkraut, I don't believe, on New Year's Day. One thing I will be able to do is I'll be able to do some resolutions. And I don't know if you're into resolutions or not. I happen to like the concept of a resolution because it's, 
it's a new day, you know, it's a new year. And if ever there was a time to be coming up with resolutions, this would be the time to do it. And uh, New Year's Day is a good day, is a good day to do it. Now you need to make sure you do it wisely. Abe Lincoln supposedly said, always bear in mind that your own resolution to succeed is more important than any other. And that's a pretty good thought. And then there are some skeptics. Someone wrote, good resolutions are simply checks that men draw on a bank where they have no account. <laughs> then that might be, that might be right. I'm not sure if I can say this one or not. Mark Twain wrote, now is the accepted time to make your regular annual good resolutions. Next week you can begin paving hell with them as usual. So I'm not sure that really fits. But in India, the most popular resolutions include losing weight, developing good habits, and working hard. And I would say that's probably the same for us. The losing weight concept, Jay Leno put that into very good perspective. He said, since there are more overweight people in America than average weight people, therefore overweight people are now average, which means you've already met your New Year's resolution. So I say I kind of I kind of like that, and you're with me on that. Okay, well. Well, I don't know about you in making resolutions, but I've got a suggestion of a resolution for you this year. So take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. There's a question that is being asked to Jesus, and it's a pretty poignant question. Of course, you recognize that questions were often asked to Christ, the purpose of which to, was to stump him or to get him to say something that would indict him so that they would have reason for arresting him and killing him. That's the reason why they're asking questions. Not to mention the fact that they wanted information, but they weren't looking to follow him by any means. Uh, some time ago, I came up with a top 10 list of questions that were asked to Christ. And some of these you're familiar with. The Sadducees asked, whose wife is it in the resurrection? And you remember they came up with a scenario. A guy died, and, and he was married, and then she had to marry his brother, and then he died, and, and then there was another brother, and according to their custom, you had to marry the brothers before you could marry anybody else, and all seven died. The real question should have been, what was wrong with the woman? All right, but that's not what they asked. They said, when they get to heaven, um, who will she be married to? You know, which one? And, of course, Jesus had a great answer for him. Number nine was John the Baptist's disciples. Uh, they said, why do we fast and your disciples do not? Number eight were the Jews. Are you a demon? Number seven, the Pharisees. Do we have to pay the IRS? Now, they didn't quite use the IRS, but you understand. Number six, the chief priests and elders. Who gave you right, the right to do all of this? Number five, can I get a divorce for any reason? Well, that's not exactly what they said, but that's what they meant. Number four, the Pharisees again. Why are you breaking bread with sinners? Number three, John the Baptist. Are you it? Or are we looking for somebody else? A little bit of doubt on John at that particular point. And then number two is the rich young ruler. What good thing do I have to do in order to get to heaven? And finally, we have this one down in verse 34. A Pharisee, a lawyer, which is the greatest commandment. Which is the greatest commandment? You've got to understand the background of this particular question to get its full impact. These guys had compiled quite a list of laws and rules. There weren't just the ten. Uh, there were hundreds of laws and rules. By first century Judaism, the number of laws had grown to 643 commands, 365 prohibitions, and 278 positive commands. That's a lot of laws, but see, they then added to those as well. And they had rules and regulations and a lot of stuff that nobody could ever understand. Unlike us in America, we would never think of adding too many rules to what we've got, would we? Yeah, well, yeah, we would, I guess. And uh, in fact, I've got a couple of them here. Maybe you're familiar with some of these laws. Uh, detonating a nuclear device within the city limits of Chico, California will result in a $500 fine. That's one of, the, one of the laws that we have on the books. It is a, considered an offense in Alaska to push a live moose out of a moving airplane. It's on the books. I'm not sure why. Here's one that was on the books. I don't know if it still is. But in Chicago, it's a law. The law states that it's illegal to eat in a place that is on fire. So if it's on fire, you're not allowed to eat there. In Kansas, there was a law, again, I doubt this is still in the books, it read this way, quote, if two trains meet on the same track, neither shall proceed until the other has passed. 
So American politicians coming up with these laws. In San Francisco, there used to be a law that said persons classified as ugly may not walk down the street. Now, who determines that? You know, um, I don't want to be involved with that. In New York, New York, the city's so nice they named it twice. There's a penalty for jumping off a building to your death. I'm not sure who gets the penalty, but there is a penalty for that. And then finally, there's an anti-crime law which requires criminals to give their victims 24-hour notice, either orally or in writing, and to explain the nature of the crime that is to be committed. Okay, we'll see how well that one has worked. Well, ridiculous stories. The Pharisees had gone so far as to classify some of the commands as to that which was more important than other commands. Um, what was the purpose of this? Well, if you were a Pharisee, what do you do with your time? You know, I mean, that was one thing, but I think more likely it was a response to the age-old sin nature that is always trying to find out how little one must do to get by. Where's the limit? If sin is here, can I go up to here uh, and still make it? Can I get up to here and maybe up to here? So you come up with these laws and you put them in various degrees and therefore you could see which ones you were committing and which ones you were not. Uh, to this day, we've got some religions that classify sins as to which are worse than others. Uh, for some, you will be condemned. Uh, others, uh, not so bad, but isn't Sin, sin? I mean, it's all breaking God's law. Back to Jesus' day, because of all this rating and categorizing sins, you had a school of interpretation which taught that the third command of the ten, taking the Lord's name in vain, was the most important. That would be the most egregious for you to commit. All the rest were minor ones. Another regarded eating with unwashed hands as being a great a crime as murder. Now, some of you moms are thinking, well, have you seen my kids and their hands? Yeah, but uh, that seems a little far-fetched. They also classified rubbing the ears of corn together on the Sabbath day with adultery. Um, these don't equate. All of this caused great confusion. Uh, and so when this guy asks this question, and if you read it from the, chat, from the book of Mark, you find out that he's not asking in an antagonistic way. He's asking in a pretty sensible way. Um, when he asks this question, this is not a far-fetched uh, question. This is not something out of there. Uh, he's asking a pretty serious question. Of all the commands, of all the rules, what's the greatest? Well, our Lord had an answer for him. One would think that Christ would immediately start quoting the Ten Commandments because they're pretty important, especially the first one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The Ten Commandments are revered by many, by me, by you as well, I'm sure. No doubt all of the commandments were very important, but the first one may have been the most important. In my book, it probably is. Yet Jesus doesn't quote one or any of the ten. He goes outside of the ten. He goes to what is overlooking all the ten, what makes up all the ten and all the rest of the rules that we come with. He goes to the highest order of the rules. In fact, he's quoting uh, from Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 through 9. We won't go there because he's quoting from it. And uh, this would be something very familiar to the Jews. Go down to verse 37, Matthew 22. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws and prophets hang on these two commandments. So let's break them down. First, first command, first commandment, love God. We are to love God, our creator, our preserver, our provider, our judge, and we are to do so with all of our heart. Is that difficult or easy to do? Well, easier said than done, right? In reality, it's difficult because how often do we really go love God? How often do we knowingly think in our heart, God, I love you. That's not something that comes across our, our minds and our lips too often. We are to love God and to do so in an exclusive manner. Jesus said, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. In the biblical concept, the heart is the very center of one's personality. 
Here also dwells the life or the soul, and here functions the mind or the power to think. The heart is where we reason, where we have our thoughts, our ideas, our convictions. I think it's interesting that Jesus, God is the one speaking this, and he identifies the heart as being that center place for us. We're kind of getting a psychology of, of humans, and, uh, and it's coming from God. This exclusivity is noted in the thrice repeated <clears throat> excuse me, phrase, all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. I was kind of taught in writing, I didn't learn a whole lot, but I was kind of taught in writing that, you know, make it simple, you know, and, and, and you could say, all your heart, mind, and soul. But he doesn't say that. And I think there's an emphasis that is placed on here, and I think it's a, a good emphasis. And I think he was doing the emphasis with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Not even the smallest corner is to be closed up against God. The whole heart, the seat of your personality. The whole soul, the sentiment of being. The whole mind, the entire activity of this, our being, is to turn to God in love. Now, Jesus mentions this as the first and the greatest command. First command. It was binding on the angels before man was created. It was binding on Adam and Eve before there ever was the Ten Commandments. It's been binding on all mankind ever since. It's the first in importance, for there is no love to a creature worthy of comparison with the love to the Creator. We use the word love somewhat flippantly. Um, sometimes we mean it quite a bit. Um, I love my wife. Um, I love the Philadelphia Eagles. I love my dog. I love chocolate cake with fudge icing on it, chocolate fudge icing on it. And I love God. Those things don't stay on the same line, do they? There's no moral equivalence to those things. They're not equal at all. And God shouldn't even be on that string. God is above all of those things. And then comes the Philadelphia Eagles, and then comes my wife, and then come. <laughs> Wait. It, it's good she walked out because uh, she's with the baby. No, she's up here, obviously. God not, needs to be number one. Above all of those things, we need to love God first. It's the first command, it's the greatest. It is the greatest because it comprehends all others. And because its demands are so great, namely the whole love of our heart, our soul, and our mind, all other commandments are weighed and measured and gauged by this one. How do you love God? The second command, and it's not the second command, he says a second command. I think that's pretty specific in the original language, and I think he said it specifically that way. He's not starting another list of ten. Uh, he's not just going to give us a list of two. He's saying this one comes out of that first one. Love others. He's now quoting from Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself. That was understood at least for the Israelites as to Israelites and aliens. But we know from Luke chapter 10, the story of the Good Samaritan, that it's not just talking about them, it's talking about everybody, that we are to love them. So the two commandments, Jesus said, stand together. The first, without the second, is intrinsically impossible. And the second cannot stand without the first, even theoretically, because disciplined altruism is not love. Love in the truest sense demands the abandonment of self to God, and God alone is the adequate incentive for such abandonment. Not just because you have a sense of care born out of an altruistic mindset, love for God first and foremost, and from that flows love for one another. I mean, it should be a natural byproduct of loving for God should be loving one another. He concludes by saying, all the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. This does not mean that the law and the prophets are derivatives from love, nor does he mean that now we can abolish all the laws and what the prophets said. Rather, this passage is in keeping with the prophetic tradition of the Old Testament, which equally demands a heart relationship with God. You cannot follow the law and the prophets without loving God. That was the problem with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders of the day. First, they didn't love God. So now they're coming up with all these laws to make it look like they love God. But they didn't love God. They needed to love him first. 
Nothing in scripture can cohere or be truly obeyed unless these two are observed. The entire biblical revelation demands heart religion marked by total allegiance to God, loving him and loving one's neighbor. These two are the nails from which all else written in the Old Testament hangs. Take away the nail and everything else falls into a heap. It would lose its meaning, its significance, and its purpose, and it would become exactly what had happened when Jesus was living here with the the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the rules they had. Everything fell into a heap. Nobody knew what they were supposed to do because there was so much that they were supposed to do. But they forgot what they really were supposed to do, and that was to love God first. After Jesus gave this answer from my reading of Scripture, nobody else asked him a question. He was done answering questions. Okay, so what's the... New Year's resolution for us. It comes in a set of three. All right. First of all, love God more. Love God more. Simple enough, isn't it? Love God more this year than you did last year. Love God more today than you did yesterday. And tomorrow than you did today and yesterday. Well, how do we do that? Go to the book of 1 John. That would be a good start where you Understand, he's talking about obedience on some occasions, especially obedience. And if you love me, you will keep my commandments, obeying God, following God. We often like to talk um, like this for fear that we, we often don't like to talk about this because we fear it might infringe upon Christian liberties and we don't want to be legalists. And yet God is pretty clear we need to follow him and follow his rules. Not rules that I dictate or Pastor Howard does or the elders But what God says, what his laws are, the more you read the Bible, the more you will see what he says, the more you follow that, the more you will love him. Do you love Jesus today? I think without reservation, every one of us would answer in the affirmative. But does your life, does my life demonstrate our love for God? Well, that's another question altogether, is it not? Love God more. That's simple. Here's the second one, equally simple, love people more. Love God more, love people more. How do we do this? Certainly it's done by reaching out to them, helping them, caring for them. You've got the parable of the Good Samaritan, I already mentioned that, you're familiar with that story. How about just being kind to others? How about just doing things for others? How about demonstrating your love by helping others out? Recently I came across a story of the early church in the third century They had an uncommon love for a certain predicament that was happening. It was during a devastating epidemic in Europe. And while non-Christians were taking their sick relatives outside of the house and dumping them on the street before they were dead, because they felt they would get the plague themselves, and so they took their loved ones and they threw them outside. Can you imagine that? Christians were taking them inside. Their own they were taking inside. And despite the fact that they knew nothing about, uh, about germs and about how those things spread, they were taking those people in and loving them and caring for them and getting sick themselves and dying themselves. That's an uncommon love for an uncommon experience. And yet that is the type of love we need to have. An uncommon love that we need for other people. In our society, that type of love sticks out. Because, see, it's a dog-eat-dog society. You know, we're after each other all the time. We show love to people. They wonder what's up. You know, what do you want from me? Well, we don't want anything. We just want to love you in Christ. Practical ways of doing this. One, live for others, not just for ourselves. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. On the heels of this, being humble. Loving others means I understand. I do not not possess all wisdom and knowledge. Therefore, we should listen to others and consider the possibility that they might be right and that we might be wrong. Philippians 2.3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. How humble are you? How humble am I? And then watch what you say. We live in a society that is so crass. Even kids use vulgar language. We need to raise the level of discourse. The tongue gets us into more trouble than any other member of our bodies. James 3, 5 through 8 warns against this danger. We should work to cleanse our language of harsh, critical, and condemning words. Everyone is so nice here at church, but, but what's your language like around your children or spouse or at home or coworkers? 
Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen, Ephesians 4.29. I don't know what you think about uh, what Phil said uh, when the... uh, from the program, uh, what is that program I'm thinking of? Phil, Phil, yeah, that one. Uh, I've never watched it, so I don't, I don't know. But some of you probably are fans, and and rightfully so. I understand it's a pretty good program. And he said some things that, although true, and we probably would agree with them, very crass. I, did he need to say it that way? I, I don't think so. Um, I think we need to be a little wiser. I'm not here to condemn him or not. Uh, I, I think he's standing up for the truth. But I just think we need to be careful with what we say and how we say it. And we can get a lot more accomplished by, by watching what we say and how we say it. How do we love others? Well, we live for others. Be humble. Watch what you say. Love your enemies. Do unto others. Romans 12, 21 says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Our biggest test comes when we are with strangers or with people who are not civil with us. Our duty to be civil to others should not depend on whether or not we agree with them morally or politically. They may be disagreeable and we are free to disagree with them, but we should do so by giving grace, doing it by love. Proverbs 15, 1, a soft answer turns away wrath. Here's a good example of whether or not you love people. This would be number five, love them so much that you want them to go to heaven with you when you die. We all have friends and relatives that don't know the Lord. We need to love them to the point that we're willing to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ and present to them how they can know that when they die, they will spend eternity with God. Just recently started a, um, a computer relationship with a computer guy, and, and I'm actually excited about it because I don't think he knows the Lord. Well, he doesn't know what he's gotten into. You know, he can fix my computers. I'm going after his soul. I mean, that just should be our natural inclination as a Christian to be looking at a person like that, to love a person to the point of that. So there's three things I said. Love God more. Love others more. And thirdly, love yourself more less. Love yourself less. Now this might get me in trouble because there are always some people who struggle with self-acceptance and they're always down on themselves and here comes a preacher suggesting that they be down on themselves even more. No, I'm not suggesting that at all. Fact of the matter is many who have a self-acceptance problem or a negative image of themselves are often narcissistic to begin with and that's why they have the problem. And I've just offended a few others, I'm sure, but... uh, (laughs) Most of us, however, love ourselves more than we love others, and that's why we don't care for other people, because we love ourselves more. We love ourselves more than we love God, and that's why we often continue in our sin. You see, this, this it's all related to love here, you know, the, the whole thing. Do I love God more? Do I love myself more? Do I love others more? Do I love myself more? Paul wrote to the Romans, he said, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So let's keep ourselves in perspective. That would be the key here. And the proper order of importance in this resolution, if you're going to join me with this, love God more every day. Love others more every day. And love ourselves a little bit less than what we were doing. Jonathan Edwards, that great American reformer and foremost theologian of the 18th century, before he was 20, came up with 70 commitments or resolutions that he valued to keep. I'd like to, in the closing moments here, look at each one of those seven and 70 and do an expository study on each one. And uh, no, I'm not going to do that at all. But I do want to mention the first two. Now, he would take these 70 and he would read them at least once a week, every day of his life. He read them every week of his life until the day he died. He would go through them at least once a week. Here's the first two. Resolution number one, I will live for God. Resolution number two, If no one else does, I still will. I like that. Love God more. Love others more. Love yourself a little less. Father, I thank you that your word is pretty clear and you had a great answer for these guys. And and you answered it, we believe, obviously inspired by God himself. Um, The greatest command at all, of all time. 
that overrides all of them is to love you. And what fits under that and naturally outflows it is to love others. So where we need to focus, obviously, is on loving you more. Start there. And as we do that, we're going to love people more. You're going to give us uh, the uncommon ability to love people above ourselves if we do that. Lord, there might be somebody who's visiting today who has never placed their faith and trust in you. They're not quite sure how to even begin to love you. I would pray that you would draw them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, recognizing that Jesus, because of your love, died on the cross for their sins, and that they just need to believe and receive and accept and trust you into their life. And I pray that they will do so today. What a tremendous resolution that would be uh, to do it today before they start the new year of accepting you. And then for us, help us to commit to you in our lives, especially in the areas that we've talked about today. May this be not only a safe New Year's for us, but a, a blessed time as we commit ourselves to growing closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.